All right, I'm going to try to speak extemporaneously for a few minutes about my problems with identity politics and why I consider it to be a scourge. Uh, this is actually hard for me to talk about because I actually see some of the validity to identity politics. You know, for example, do I think that African Americans and other minorities face challenges and problems that white Americans don't? Absolutely. Do I think gay people face challenges that straight people don't? Yes. Do I feel trans people face additional challenges? Absolutely. Disabled people? 100%. But I think the problem with identity politics is that instead of just asking people to accept the fact that people in different situations might face different challenges than they do, it paints white people in particular, the white working class as a sort of collection of individuals that face no challenges. And that's just simply not the case. You know, white people, especially those that are middle class, lower middle class, or living in poverty, face tons of challenges every day. More to the point, you can't really just reduce an individual to what group they belong to. You're saying that, you know, this particular person, well, he has white skin and he's a man. So therefore he's a white male and white males are privileged. Well, I mean, this should be obvious to anybody, but you don't know that that's the case for that person. The guy might be working 70 hours a week. Uh, He might have severe medical issues. He might not be making enough money to pay his bills and support his family. He might be strung out on opioids. You don't know. And it's it's just dismissive to reduce people that way. You know, you talk about reductionist ideologies. Idpol is, is the quintessential reductionist ideologies. Why are we reducing people to, to racial conformity? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I actually think I know what the answer is, and I think I know why all corporations are on board with it. It's because it's a convenient divide and conquer tactic that they can use to turn the working class against one another. Look, what's going on in France right now, Israel, Greece, all over the world, really, is we're starting to see the revolution begin. Insurrection is beginning to foment in several countries around the world. When I was over in France, I saw the protests going on, and it was like unlike anything I'd ever seen in America, including George Floyd during the pandemic. I heard on the news that they had upwards of 200,000 people engaged in the protests against Macron because they're raising the age that they can receive Social Security two years. <clears throat> 200,000 people. I mean, when you think about that, it's really crazy, and they're they're very lucky that the protests have been largely peaceful so far because I don't care how big your police department is, how well armed they are, you're not going to be able to control 200,000 people in the streets if it turns into a mob scene. You just can't. Now, so far, uh, Emmanuel Macron has not been able to get this passed, but he's going to. And when he does, France is going to go completely apeshit. Uh, Israel, as soon as Netanyahu changes the court system so he can select the people that are going to try him, Israel is going to go completely bananas. It's going to start to happen. It's probably going to start in one country and just spread like wildfire. But I think we may be looking at the beginning of, of the next French Revolution. I really do, because they're going to tear down the fucking Capitol building as soon as that law goes through. You ask, why isn't this happening in America right now when we're getting screwed probably worse than any other Western nation? Well, in France, it's the unions that are running the show. They're the ones that are leading their workers to shut down the airport, shut down uh, the train system, cut the electricity to politicians' homes. I mean, these are the things that are really going to bring power to the negotiating table. Because the people in charge, they'll give you enough rope to hang yourself. But ultimately, they're always going to act in their best interests, in their own best interests. 
And if they realize, hey, if we take more of these people's entitlements away from them and we keep pushing this austerity, they're going to rebel and they're going to come to come to our houses and cut our fucking heads off while our children sleep. They're going to think twice about doing that. Remember, the goal for them is always accumulation of wealth, accumulation of power, and accumulation of resources. That's what this whole war in Ukraine is about right now is the accumulation of resources. Russia and NATO are fighting over what's going to happen with the gas reserves and who gets to control Western Europe. And I'm not going to come down and say I'm pro Ukraine. I'm certainly not pro Russia. I'm honestly pro peace. I'm very, very anti war, but I'm also against sovereign nations being invaded. So to say that I'm either pro or against what's going on in Ukraine, it, it's far too complex to offer such a simple answer. But I know enough to know that Russia feels threatened by our nuclear weapons. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, at least if you, if you take Putin at his word, which is always a precarious thing to do, he seems to feel that this all dates back to the Minsk Accord with NATO pushing to put nukes in the Ukraine and other surrounding territories. Also, Putin's entire family, when he was a child, was wiped out by the Nazis in World War II in the Battle of Leningrad, if I remember correctly. So how do you think he feels about the Germans sending tanks to help the Ukraine? I'm going to say that he doesn't feel very good about that at all. And he probably has a, a bit of a chip on his shoulder watching Germany build their army back up. <clears throat> because even though he was, I think he was born after World War II ended, the, uh, he certainly heard the stories about how his uncles, his grandmother, and his brother were, were killed fighting to defend Russia from the Nazis. So I don't think he wants to go down that road again. But Oh, so I was talking about identity politics. Look, what the power elite is most threatened by is an uprising, a citizen uprising, where the majority of the population realizes, A, these elites are screwing us, and B, the only way we're going to get even is by getting together in large numbers and taking out our aggression on them. I don't necessarily mean killing them either. It, it may be just as simple as getting 200,000 people in Washington, D.C. and surrounding the White House and, and chanting, stop the war, stop the war, just as they did during Vietnam. And if you notice, we eventually did pull out of Vietnam due to pressure from the general public. However, the government's more sophisticated nowadays. They were pretty sophisticated back then with COINTELPRO. And I, I noticed this too when I was going to Occupy Wall Street uh, gatherings. I went to one in Oakland one time. <clears throat> and we're marching, and basically everyone's just being real chill. Uh, if you remember, if you've ever been to an Occupy rally, you'd probably remember that they weren't that high stakes. They were actually kind of a nebulous gathering of people that were just kind of dissatisfied with the system overall. But all of a sudden, I'm walking down Broadway, and I see this guy run up to a hotel take a brick and throw it through the window completely unprovoked now could it have been a lone nut yeah possibly but i'm inclined to think that that was an agent provocateur like i really do I, I, and i'm this is something i need to research a bit more but i've heard several people i trust say that the fbi oakland pd and the california state police were sending in undercover agents to break up Occupy Wall Street. And it was actually shortly after that that the whole thing kind of fizzled out. <clears throat> but the other thing that was going on at that time was uh, at some of the gatherings, people were showing up on stage and instigating this pro progressive stack stuff where, oh, you want to speak to the crowd? Well, I'm sorry, you're white. We're going to take you off the list because we have uh, a black lesbian in a wheelchair who needs to speak first. You know, in other words, I'm okay with identity politics when it comes to recognizing special challenges that groups face. But when you're eliminating entire groups of people based on their race, 
or even their class, it, you're you got to look at any protest movement as a collection of minds, right? A collection of individuals, each who could potentially offer something. If you're knocking sixty or seventy percent of people out of the pool right away, hey, do you do you, do you think that they're going to want to give one hundred percent to the movement? And B, what's going to help you when the Republican Party comes along and says, "Hey, white guy, we see the other side is is uh, you know dissing you guys and saying that you're not fit to be part of them." Well, here we're the Republican Party. We have a big tent. Why don't you come and join us? You know, most logical people might not do that, but there there'll be some that will. And I mean, the, the Democratic Party up until around the time of Bill Clinton was a party of workers. It was a party of labor. They defended labor and they instituted policies that supported labor. But, you know, you can see it nowadays. Most of the white working class is not vote Democrat and the party is in real trouble. And the only way they've been able to survive is by forming a new coalition that's comprised of minority groups. But, Despite their best efforts with all this identity politics stuff, even you see it now in, in the last election, a lot of these minority groups are going over to the other side, particularly Hispanics and Asians. Because, you know, a lot of them are first generation, second generation immigrants who've made a little money for themselves. They're socially conservative. And they say to themselves, these Democrats are crazy. Why Why do they think they're crazy? Because there's, you know, certain cultures, like it or not, they're just not down with trans people. They get really scared when they think about trans people going into their bathrooms or talking to their kids. I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous. I think it's, personally, I think it's bananas. It's totally ridiculous, but you're scaring them away. One more thing I have to talk about here. Look, if you support human rights if you're truly a humanist and you want an egalitarian society that's good for everybody it's going to take a third party to do this we saw what happened with bernie sanders he had the the momentum going into 2020 until they got to south carolina and obama was able to convince their representative jim clyburn to endorse joe biden south carolina largely african-american state that tends to vote for, I mean, as, as it turned out, who the black representative of the state ultimately endorsed. Why the African-American voters of South Carolina are so malleable, I do not know. Um, again, I'm speaking in generalities here, but uh, Bernie Sanders got rat fucked in 2020. There's no way you can tell me any differently. What was it? There were seven, I want to say there were seven candidates heading into that primary. And all of them dropped out on the same day, except for Joe Biden and Bernie and all of them endorsed Biden. You would have to be blind to reality to not think that Obama put in a phone call to them and said, look, either you guys drop out or you're going to lose your funding because he, you know, he's got the purse strings of the DNC, him and Hillary. And I mean, I don't have to tell you if you want to run for office in this country, you need money. And that goes to the heart of Occupy Wall Street, because, you know, a lot of people even today think that Occupy Wall Street did not have a stated goal. That's not true. You can go on Wikipedia and see what their stated goal was. The stated goal of Occupy Wall Street was campaign finance reform, because they knew even back in the early 2000s, when this was going on, they knew that politicians were buying their way into office and that it took capital. It took a lot of capital to even get a seat at the table. I'm old enough to remember when Ralph Nader was running for president and he showed up at the debates because there was a rule at the time. I think if you were polling greater than 3%, you would be allowed to debate and Nader was polling at around four or 5%. He shows up at the debates and they escorted him out. Capital wants what capital gets every time there's a candidate with the even a fringe well i wouldn't say fringe even a moderately minority position on an issue that they don't agree with 
They're lambasted. They're made to look stupid. I mean, you've seen it before. Howard Dean. Howard Dean is, is a moderate Democrat, but he was just a little too much to the left. And so they took that famous Dean scream clip of him making that odd noise and played it all over CNN until he, the guy became a laughing stock. It was crazy. Uh, Dennis Kucinich, pretty solid leftist pro worker candidate, marginalized, never given any exposure. But with Bernie, what we saw was, and I'll give credit to Norman Finkelstein because he's the one that's pointed this out in his book. The people that came after Bernie were the identity politicians. Ibram X. Kendi, Whoopi Goldberg. People like that would come on and, and say, oh, Bernie's got a problem with the blacks. Uh, Bernie's got a problem with reparations. Uh, Bernie's soft on the reparations question. Uh, we saw we saw other feminists coming out and saying, oh, no, Bernie uh, appeals to an exclusively male audience. Uh, Bernie bros, Bernie bros. Yeah, you got to watch out for those Bernie bros. This stuff was entirely made up by the media and by id poll grifters. I mean, the entire thing is a grift. Black Lives Matter, I'm sorry, I agree with the stated goals of Black Lives Matter, but the people in charge of it are grifters. Do some basic research and look where all the money is gone. They're buying real estate, they're buying mansions, they're paying themselves exorbitant salaries. It's a grift. There's uh, one other thing I'd like to add really quick, and this is just pertaining to these absolute chuds that are going into school board meetings and trying to shut them down because little Johnny or Janie read a book that had some scary ideas in it. You people are fucking morons. There's no other way to put it. If you truly believe the greatest problem facing society is that your kid might get exposed to some wrong think in school, and you take it to the extreme to where you're showing up at a school board meeting and trying to get people canceled, then you're just as bad as any identity politics person out there. It's just that the identity politics you practice isn't even based in reality. I don't say this very often, but check your fucking privilege. You're an absolute chud, and you're to be laughed at. And believe me, most of us are laughing at you. I watch clips of this stuff all the time, and I find it absolutely hilarious. The only part that's not funny is that real people's lives are getting impacted by this. Uh, For example, this is the absolute worst. I just saw a story about a school principal in Tallahassee, Florida, who got her job suspended because the art teacher showed a picture of Michelangelo's David to some of the kids in the school. Michelangelo's David, one of the greatest works of art that our planet has ever been graced with. And some fucking chud parents decided to raise a fuss and get the principal canceled. I don't even know what to say. You take a look at what's going on in the United States of America right now in terms of income inequality, the war that we're pouring billions of dollars into, the fact that most of the rest of the world is going up in flames right now, and what you're concerned about is that your kid might have to see a stone penis on a statue from the 15th century? Fuck you. Fuck you and everything you stand for. You people are a joke to me. And I seriously hope that in your ignorance, you're not going to see what's coming to hit you right in the fucking forehead because it's coming. Believe me. The money you made operating your jet ski dealership in the Texas suburbs is not going to be enough to save you. And I'll just put it like that. I'm not even saying from a violence perspective. I'm saying save you from your own karma. Are you such a terrible parent that you're afraid that your kid hearing about slavery in school is going to make them hate you? And let's be real. If you think slavery was a myth, yes, your children probably will grow up to hate you because they will realize what an ignorant fool you are. 
if you think just hearing about communism or socialism is going to corrupt little Johnny or Janie's mind and turn them into a rampant socialist, well, I can only hope that it does. I think it would be ultimate hilarity to see you in your fat suburban ass in your jet ski dealership and your <laughs> Chevy suburban that you cart your damn kids to school at every day that gets eight miles to the gallon have to deal with a couple little upstart socialists in your home. Well, you can always go online and talk to your QAnon friends about that. And you guys can commiserate while the rest of the world passes you by. Seriously. Fuck you. I'm out.